without her permission. VOA won the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today, you will hear stories from Dan Friedel, Katie Weaver, Gina Bennett, and Gregory Stockel. Later, Jill Robbins talks about nouns and sports teams in a new everyday grammar lesson. But first, Dan and Katie have this report on the effects that immigrants have on the U.S. economy. Economic experts and business owners in the United States say immigrant workers have helped keep the country from falling into a recession. Economists predicted the United States economy would suffer when the country's central bank started raising the baseline rate for lending money about two years ago. Instead, businesses have hired more workers. The unemployment rate has gone down. But rates have continued to rise. The reason, experts say? People like Luisana Silva and Mariel Marrero, immigrants from Venezuela. Silva, who is 25, lives in South Carolina and works for a rug company. She loads heavy carpets onto trucks for delivery. Silva, her husband, and their seven-year-old daughter left Venezuela, walked through dangerous lands before arriving at the United States border city of Brownsville, Texas. They asked for asylum from the United States, claiming the need to escape political and economic difficulties at home. Silva and her husband received work permits last year and found jobs. Silva earns enough to pay for a living space, buy food for her family, put fuel in her car, and send money back to her parents in Venezuela. She wants to help her family back home and build a life for herself in the U.S. Marielle Marrero, 32, left Venezuela in 2016 after receiving death threats for voicing opposition to President Nicolas Maduro. She lived in Panama and El Salvador before arriving in the U.S. and asking for asylum. The U.S. is still considering her case. For now, Marrero has a short-term work permit. She lives in a small city outside of Miami, Florida, where many Venezuelan immigrants live. Marrero has worked several small jobs. She is now able to save about $200 each month to send to her family back in Venezuela. Heidi Scherholz is president of the Economic Policy Institute in Washington, D.C., she is also a former chief economist at the U.S. Labor Department. She said economic observers considered it something of a mystery that the U.S. had strong job growth, but also saw inflation drop while interest rates rose. Most believed the U.S. would see more unemployment. The immigration numbers being higher than what we had thought, that really does pretty much solve that puzzle, Scherholtz said. Still, immigration is set to be a central issue of this year's U.S. presidential election. Former President Donald Trump is the leading candidate opposing President Joe Biden in the race. He is criticizing Biden over what he believes is a lack of control at the southern U.S. border. Trump has described migrants as criminals and has said they are 
poisoning the blood of America. Trump says he wants to finish building the border wall that was a big part of his presidential campaign in 2016. Back in 2019, the Congressional Budget Office estimated net immigration, the number of new people minus those who left, would be about 1 million in the year 2023. The actual number turned out to be 3.3 million. Many employers have welcomed the new arrivals. When the United States ended some of its COVID-19 restrictions and businesses reopened, business owners found a changed workforce. The number of native-born Americans in their prime working years, ages 25 to 54, had dropped. Many Americans had aged out of that group and were nearing retirement. This group's numbers have shrunk by 770,000 since February 2020, just before COVID-19 hit. But over the past four years, immigrants have filled that gap. The number of prime-age workers has increased by 2.8 million. 96% of those workers were born outside the United States. The Economic Policy Institute said immigrants accounted for almost 19% of the U.S. labor force in 2023. That is a record number. Jan Gautam is the top leader of a hotel business in Orlando, Florida. He said most Americans do not want to take jobs cleaning hotel rooms in his company's 44 hotels. He said 85% of his 3,500 employees are immigrants. Without employees, you are broken, said Gautam, who is an immigrant from India. In the northeastern American state of Maine, Half of the workers at the Flood Brothers Dairy Farm are immigrants. Jenny Tilton Flood is a partner in the farm. She said, Immigrant workers are skilled at feeding cows and collecting milk. Almost 70,000 liters per day. We would not have an economy in Maine or in the U.S., if we did not have highly skilled labor that comes from outside of this country, Tilton Flood said. Wendy Edelberg and Tara Watson are economists at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. They wrote in a study that over the past two years, immigrants permitted the U.S. to generate jobs without pushing inflation higher and causing a recession. They added that the U.S. can now absorb up to 200,000 new jobs per month without pushing up inflation. In the past, economists said the number of new workers could not go higher than 100,000 per month without causing an inflation increase. Douglas Holtz Eakin once led the Congressional Budget Office. He said, The way to solve an inflation crisis is to endure an immigration crisis. Observers agree that immigration as it stands in the United States can be difficult for state and local governments, even if it has helped the economy. About 27% of the 3.3 million immigrants who came to the United States last year did so as lawful permanent residents. The rest, 2.4 million, either came without permission, overstayed their visas, 
are waiting for their cases to be heard in immigration court or are part of a program that lets them stay temporarily and sometimes work in the country. Some experts say immigrants who come to the U.S. do important work that many Americans will not do. They are also likely to start new businesses. While the experts debate what to do, Marrero, the Venezuelan immigrant living in Florida, said she feels lucky to be in the country. I imagine having my own company, my house, helping my family in a more comfortable way, Marrero said. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Dan Friedel. of the world's 75 poorest countries are getting poorer compared to the richest economies. That finding comes from the World Bank. The development agency based in Washington, D.C., recently released a report on the least developed nations. It said that the difference in income growth per person in the poorest countries and the richest, has widened over the past five years. It is the first time the difference has increased since the beginning of the 2000s. Ion Kose is Deputy Chief Economist of the World Bank and one of the writers of the report. He told Reuters, For the first time, we see there is no convergence, they're getting poorer. He said the report writers saw a very serious structural regression. Jose said that is why the report is bringing attention to it. The writers studied the 75 countries that can receive financial aid and zero-interest loans from the World Bank's International Development Association, or IDA. The report said the nations risk losing 10 years of development without changes in policy and a lot of international aid. Kose said growth in many IDA countries had already begun to slow before the COVID-19 pandemic. But it was just 3.4% in 2020 to 2024. That is the weakest five years of growth since the early 1990s. The report blamed Russia's invasion of Ukraine, climate change, and increases in violence and conflict as the main influences on the country's development. More than half of all IDA countries are in sub-Saharan Africa, or Africa south of the Sahara Desert. Fourteen are in the Asia-Pacific area, and eight are in Latin America and the Caribbean area. 31 have per-person incomes of less than $1,315 a year. Those countries include the Democratic Republic of Congo, Afghanistan, and Haiti. One in three IDA countries is poorer now than they were at the beginning of the pandemic. IDA countries make up 92% of the world's people who lack enough affordable, nutritious food. Additionally, 
Half of the countries are in debt distress. That means they are either unable to pay their debt or are at high risk of failing to make payments. These countries have some resources. Many are rich in natural resources and have the possibility of solar energy. They also have young populations at a time when populations are aging in developed countries. However, private and government creditors have been less willing to loan these countries money. U.S. Treasury Under Secretary Jay Shamba discussed the situation recently. He warned that China and other emerging official creditors are gaining by reducing loans to low income countries as the International Monetary Fund and development banks are making money available. He said that almost 40 countries saw more money leaving the country to pay debt than coming in as new loans in 2022. And he said that situation likely increased in 2023. Kose called for ambitious policies to increase investment. He urged countries to make policy improvements. To strengthen their financial systems. He also added that countries should make structural changes to improve education and increase income. Kose also called for financial support from the world community to lower the risk of limited economic growth. He noted that the World Bank. Hoped rich countries will increase financial support for the IDA by December. The report added that stronger international efforts on climate change, debt restructuring, and measures supporting international trade remained important. And Dermot Gill is chief economist of the World Bank. He noted that China, India, and South Korea had once been among the world's poorest countries. He said they were able to deal with poverty and raise living standards. Those countries are now among the world's strongest economies. He said the world cannot afford. To turn its back on IDA countries. I'm Gina Bennett. And I'm Gregory Stockel. VOA Learning English has launched a new program for children. It is called Let's Learn English with Anna. The new course aims to teach children American English through asking and answering questions. And experiencing fun situations. For more information, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. Week's everyday grammar. We answer a question from a reader named Saul. Saul asked, "When you make a question about a team such as the Bay Packers, do you say 'Are the Bay Packers famous?' or 'Is the Bay Packers famous?'" Saul is talking about the Green Bay Packers. The professional American football team is based in the city of Green Bay, Wisconsin. The team's name, the Packers, comes from a local meat packing plant where one of the team founders worked. Finding the answer to Saul's question will help us learn about different kinds of nouns in American English. Let's start with the simple answer to Saul's question. 
we usually use the plural form of the be verb to talk about a team name that includes a plural noun. David Zeren wrote this about the Packers in the New Yorker magazine. The Packers are owned by the fans. In this sentence, the third-person plural verb form are agrees with the plural noun Packers. When we simply use the word team, we are using a collective noun. A collective noun refers to a number of people, but we usually treat it like a singular noun. Other collective nouns include audience, government, committee, and staff. That is why you would expect most Americans to say, his team is playing well this season. But English speakers in other countries often treat collective nouns as plural nouns. People in Britain and Ireland, for example, might instead say, his team are playing well this season. Sometimes Americans talk or write about a sports team without using the team's actual name. Instead, they refer to the team by the city they represent. Here is an example of what we mean from Wikipedia. Green Bay is the third oldest team in the National Football League. The B verb is singular, is, because the city name, Green Bay, is a singular noun. We can write the structure like this. Plural noun plus third person plural verb form. Singular or collective noun plus third person singular verb form. Many American sports teams have plural names like the Kansas City Chiefs, the Detroit Lions, and the New England Patriots. These names are all count nouns. But some teams have names that are non-count or mass nouns. They include the National Basketball Association's Miami Heat, Orlando Magic, and the Oklahoma City Thunder. This is where things get a little tricky. Let's use the Orlando Magic as an example. The word magic is a non-count noun. Magic is a power that lets someone do impossible things by saying special words or performing special actions. When we talk about magic, we use singular verb forms. But in the case of the Orlando Magic basketball team, some sports writers treat the non-count noun team name as a plural. For example, the Orlando Magic official website says, The Orlando Magic are one of the only two teams to beat the Chicago Bulls in a playoff series in the 1990s. Note the use of the third-person plural verb form of be. Now, let's travel outside of the United States to see how other sports teams are discussed. Teams in the Union of European Football Associations, or UEFA, are often named after the city that sponsors them. But Real Madrid is a little different. The team got the approval of King Alfonso XIII of Spain in 1920 and can use the Spanish word for royal. Sports writer Manuel Esposito wrote on Soccer Feed, Real Madrid is known for attracting the world's best players. The Athletic Club of Bilbao is another UEFA team. In a recent story for ESPN, British reporter Sid Lowe followed the British-English preference of making collective nouns plural. Athletic are a unique club, famously following a policy of playing only with Basque players. Coming back to the United States, a lot of people in the sports world this week are talking about star basketball player Caitlin Clark. During her college career at the University of Iowa, she broke the all-time scoring record for men and women. Now, she is going professional. Look at how sports writers talked about her new professional basketball team. On Monday, the Women's National Basketball Association held their yearly event in which teams can pick players for the upcoming season. The WNBA team from the state of Indiana, Indiana Fever, 
got the chance to pick first. Not surprisingly, the team chose Clark. The team's website announced the news like this. Indiana Fever select Caitlin Clark with number one overall pick in 2024 WNBA draft. Yet the WNBA announced it this way. Indiana Fever selects Caitlin Clark with first overall pick in WNBA draft 2024. Here is a quiz question for you. If the team name Indiana Fever is a collective noun, which sentence is correct, according to American English? When you answer, tell us about your favorite sports team. Write a sentence or two using the team's name and let us know if the name is a count noun or a collective noun. And that's Everyday Grammar. I'm Jill Robbins. Jill Robbins with this week's Everyday Grammar Lesson. Jill joins me now to talk more about the grammar and fun facts connected to the program. Hi, Jill. Thanks for being on the show today. Thanks for inviting me, Ashley. Your Everyday Grammar Lesson this week was about talking about sports. I don't think you usually talk about sports very much, do you? No, I don't. So I'm definitely not an expert like our friend Dan Friedel. But I learned a lot from doing this story. Can you tell us some of what you learned? Well, I learned about the U.S. football team, the Green Bay Packers. I didn't know they were a community-owned team. Usually the owner is a rich person who is looking to make a profit. But with the Packers, it is a nonprofit. And since it is closely tied to the community, the team can't be sold and moved to another city. That's interesting. I did know that. Um, did you learn about other teams? Yes, I didn't know before that Real Madrid had a royal approval from the King of Spain. And another Spanish team, Bilbao's Athletic Club, is made up of only Basque players. That is an area in the north of Spain. I know there is something special about their language. Yes, it's called an isolate. That means it's not related to any known language. The language and culture were oppressed, but now they are being revived. And what can you tell us about the recent news in women's professional basketball? Your lesson mentions Caitlin Clark. Yes, isn't it exciting? I watched her last few games with my family in Indiana. They were all really excited that she is going to be playing for their state's team, Indiana Fever. And that name is a non-count noun, right? I'm calling it a collective noun. It represents a group of people. Okay, so it goes with a singular form of a verb? I can't tell you that. That's our quiz question for this week. Let's let the listeners answer that first. Hmm. All right. Good luck to our listeners. And thanks again, Jill, for answering my questions today. Thank you, Ashley. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. Music